very interested in the theme of Oasis, very new to me, to be honest, and um, yeah, pretty interesting to hear what you are going to, what we are doing about it. Hi, uh, I'm Carsten from Edible City here in Kassel, and we, um, our vision is also to plant Oasis. We do this for more than 10 years now in Kassel in terms of uh, uh, fruit trees and settings of forest gardens and I'm very interested in forest gardens and how to develop this also here in Germany more and more. Hi, I'm Renee and um, I'm a professor for urban design and urban planning and yeah, I'm, should I explain now or later? Yeah? And I would like to explain a bit, like we had this um, cooperative uh, workshop about an oasis in Kassel and the main idea was how could we um, adapt this con the concept of an oasis in Morocco um, to our area in Kassel. Like the main question was how would an oasis in Kassel look like with our local um, conditions like for example the wind, how summer and winter uh, in Germany, how's the climate, uh, what materials can we use, um, what do we need, what can we bring together and also what are the social processes behind an oasis and we try to okay. discuss that. Hi, I'm Jan, I'm a uh, student of uh, urban planning in Kassel and um, I was a participant at the workshop uh, with Carlos um, and René and uh, yeah we had a talk about uh, where we could uh, locate our oasis in uh, castles and um, we gathered information and uh, yeah, try to develop an idea of an oasis. I'm, I'm Carlos, uh, I'm an architect from Ceuta but uh, spending half of my time in the desert uh, making some researches uh, not just on, on architecture but also on agriculture, nomadism and when Lady Sweet proposed, uh, uh, wanted to propose a, a workshop in, during this uh, Documenta 15, I thought that maybe what we have learned in the in the desert in the oasis in Morocco could be interesting to be applied, because for me it's a real urban planning uh, method or methodology that should be applied not just in Morocco but also in in Europe and, and, and other places. So we just try to think uh, what are the problems that we have here in Kassel and what could be the solution with the same mentality people have in the desert, which means to build cities uh, just with what we find in the in the plot, no? which is not easy uh, at all. No? Um, <laughs> yeah, I had a really intensive uh, workshop because I was the only participant. <laughs> but um, for me, I've learned um, about the oasis uh, and mainly about uh, the social implications that it brings uh, to build an oasis. Uh, what, what you need, what uh, kind of organizational structures you, you do you have to implement? And um, for me, it was really interesting to transfer an idea from a different, a really different uh, climate zone and uh, with different resources into what we do have here, and to think about the conditions that are here and how can we apply the principles, the the, the basic principles, uh, into uh, our planning, uh, how it's done here. So also to rethink our way of thinking uh, the creation of cities. That was really, really interesting. Um, also because um, of the simplicity of the that you have, but it's also the complexity. So you have really, really limited resources, but it's a really complex system that is uh, around those resources. That was really interesting to learn. Um, Marco, you have been developing a project in an agricultural area in, in Kassel and I would like you, both of you, to explain also what is the situation about the Greek areas in Kassel and the impact of the Greek area as important spaces in, in the world. Yeah, well, when I came here two years ago, um, it was very interesting, of course, we were, I was looking for this kind of, yeah, what is local knowledge in Kassel-Ost, 
and of course the Fulda Auen, very close to the river, are a very specific kind of uh, countryside uh, uh, landscape, um, which is uh, defined more or less by that there is a very uh, good soil where you can grow very well things. Uh, due to that it was a, a floodland, it's a, it's a potential floodland, and I think uh, with this it is some. How I wouldn't say an oasis in Kassel, but uh, it's a very specific situation that produces a very specific knowledge also in the use of the land, and that was what we were interested in. And when I met Carsten and uh, all the others that are involved in it, uh, it was really interesting that um, yeah, maybe you could say that in, in Kassel Ostend, in the Fulda Auen, especially, you find something like a archive of garden projects and urban farming projects that really try to deal with the future problems in a very serious way and uh, yeah maybe Carsten is uh, the professional in it because he is in nearly all of these projects involved in a way but also yeah you invented uh, you you started with this uh, project Esbar uh, Stadt um, and um, well we are just now trying to learn from you actually right now so we better you say something about what you are doing now. Um. Yeah, uh, with the Edible City project, we we made a concept like uh, 13 years ago um, to uh, see the whole city as a potential place for for growing food also, ne? and especially the acknowledgement of the importance to pl plant trees. We focused on edible trees, on fruit trees, walnut trees, and we have a program of planting trees and negotiating this with the city council also and to make it possible and um, starting community gardens so now in 22 we have like uh, five garden projects which we manage more or less and uh, try to um, um, bring in people from the neighborhood and which working more or less in different situations and also always acknowledgement the potential of uh, bringing together also productive spaces, just creating spaces and uh, um, supporting and uh, establishing biodiversity through, through making uh, biotopes with, for the people and for the animals. And, uh, and that's, uh, I think, a very uh, important idea for city planning and uh, it's also in the discourse today somehow of city planning, edible city, Esparstadt somehow is a term already now, um, and, but still um, there are a lot of um, possibilities which are not, um, um, yeah, it, there is <laughs> Luft nach oben, how you say in German. <laughs> Yeah, to the top. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this is a um, very interesting topic for us to this tension between city planning and the local authorities and the vision that a city has and could also integrate uh, yeah, visions which are sought from the future. That was kind of a starting point to think the, the situation from the future. So yeah, it's. We'll see you how it's going I, on. I have to say that uh, even in, in, in Morocco it's sometimes di difficult because we are talking about urban planning and we are talking about agriculture as two separate elements. Mm. And I, I have the sensation that in Europe it's more agriculture in the city is more about something ecological, something social. But what I have learned that uh, sometimes Agriculture is going to develop or to protect the city, but sometimes the, the architecture, the urban planning, can protect the, uh, the agriculture, depending on the situation and the context. You know? Overall, when we are talking about planting a new oasis, in the desert we have to be protected from the wind and from the sun. You have to know the trees which are going to die. So, yeah, architecture can protect because you can build something quickly which is going to provide this shadow or this projection. But the problem is that, uh, I don't know, do you teach agriculture in urban planning? Well, actually, no, I don't. It's a good question. No, I don't. Um, but we, but we do think a lot about is how can um, design adapt to 
climate change? How can it, can a city like German Germany is very often how can a city become more resilient to crisis to to like the hot events and hot waves that we have right now again? So, but there's um, actually not. I don't know from a discourse where we really discuss urban planning and um, agriculture. And the, the case we have here in Kassel that actually the um, the Fulda hour is used for it and in a very central place in the middle of the city is just because this is a flooding area and this is why it's protected by urban planning but it's but the sense of urban planning was not to have a small oasis for food production which is collective organized um, what they wanted is that, that nobody lives there who can be harmed by a flood and it's interesting actually that here something happened because of some plans but it's completely without, the, uh, like it's not intended by the plants. I think that's very interesting and maybe from this case we can also learn that it's actually maybe good to have these open um, use spaces within a city, like very central, because in Germany cities usually are organized like this, that we have the center and the agriculture is always at the border, at, um, quite far away, so you also have a lot of ways if you want to transport, um, you know, in this case, um, products from agriculture. Right? And there's also no real protection, like the city doesn't protect the agriculture and the agriculture doesn't protect the city. So there's no um, correlation, no link between these two topics, I would say, until now. But th there is also some, something missed, that we are, we are talking agriculture as something that is going to provide food, but we were talking about providing material for construction. So imagine when we are talking about sustainability in architecture. I don't know if we, you say, we say in English, carbon print. But imagine the carbon print of someone that uh, all the energy he's going to need is to take the, the, the earth from mm -hmm. his own plot and to put and to make the raw earth construction. And then to bring the wood out of his parcel and to put that. You don't need the So you don't need energy, just your own energy. As we, we saw, we can do that with this And that's yes. something that I realize is more important to convince people that this element we are talking about uh, climate change, we are talking about food, we are talking also about how we can build things. Um, that's another component that we have been talking is uh, you are going to plant trees in that case, but with a purpose, well, multiple purposes, protection from the wind, from the sun, what is needed. Uh, but maybe also pine trees in the desert, everything is used. Nothing but except the branches to make the bread, nothing is burned, or nothing is. Uh, so everything is reused or recycled. So also, it's, uh, but I don't know if we have to arrive to a extreme point where at a catastrophe to say okay. So maybe that what we are going to face next winter that we are not going to have energy. So people have to to think in another way because people cannot say no that way of building is not correct. The best protection against the wind and the sorry, against the cold weather and hot weather is the rammed earth. But I find one point really interesting, I mean very basic, but for example in Germany for sure the agriculture is not connected to any kind of idea of town, right? So uh, agriculture happens outside of town, nature happens outside of town. Um, so it's a very strict kind of a, of a, of a um, uh, it's, it's, it's separated, you know. Um, and I think that's also what happens. For example, uh, the people in the city don't think about that in Germany, agriculture is completely industrialized outside. They still think it as a romantic symbol, you know. On the when they go uh, on the weekend, you know, they go out to the farm. And they see the farm and they are happy and they think, ah, oh, it's like nature, but it's a horse farm and there are horses and everything, which has nothing to do with agriculture. So it's a completely, and also not with nature, so it's a completely other kind of film that is running. And I think uh, that's really interesting, for example, in what Sulavi or the people here are doing um, in the middle of the town, in a way, due to this kind of special kind of area yeah, in, 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 in Fuldaauen, that they 
can do it in the middle of the town, more or less. So that suddenly the people um, see what uh, it means, you know, to bring it together. And I think it's a very interesting idea because uh, also Solavi, for example, they always say like, hey, we can't feed the world with that, you know. But it has a didactic aspect. Um, and I think it's very important because what you say, for example, that there could also be, there's materials grown and everything that's much more further than where we are. And uh, I think at first it's really important to uh, yeah, in include this kind of agricultural moment within uh, uh, city systems or towns, you know, uh, out of several reasons. The, the first one for sure is more didactic or like trying to teach the people again how important it is that we are somehow connected with uh, where our food comes from, etc. Um, but then also go into this kind of idea of production or something. I mean, that's nice with Karsten's Garden because it's in the middle of a normal worker area, right? So, I mean, they are even not intellectualized like we are. I mean, they are just normal people. To be honest, what, what do they think about what you do there? No, um, some older people are also critical and say what a wild mess this garden is, but then there are more and more neighbors coming and joining in and having their plots and uh, growing their vegetable and have quite a good uh, part for their subsistence which they uh, harvest there. No? <laughs> And uh, it's still a, de a decision maybe to make between agriculture, urban agriculture, urban gardening. These are two terms. We come more from this urban gardening point, but also with trees. No? That's, a, that's a thing and that's a, a very important to plant trees and uh, in the city for also for making the climate better, but also in the countryside that's the most important thing to, to uh, make our landscape sustain, we need much more trees in the countryside. Uh, that's the concept of uh, agroforestry. And uh, uh, urban perspective and countryside perspective from the agriculture farmers or so, that's quite a different world, but that it can uh, it can uh, um, bring it together somehow. It's, uh, from both sides, so it's also very important the network of the local production around town. Um, we have um, all this network is there somehow of the um, Erzeuger, of the people who grow grow the fruit in, out of the town and how it comes in the town. So we meet in the cities, we need the food hubs which um, bring in the products of the countryside into town and make better structure for for um, dividing food. Uh, it's a complex um, uh, field, the whole thing about uh, food. But uh, yeah, we need food hubs, we need more places in town where people experience or learn about cooking, about making sauerkraut or fermentation. and. Um, and then in, uh, in the urban situation, the interesting thing now is the idea of urban forest garden, urbane Waldgärten. And in Kassel we have a good uh, chance to realize this, because Kassel is now a model community city, uh, just Berlin and Kassel, for urban forest gardens. So we have two um, plots now in Kassel. One is not so far away from the Fulda Aue area, where there uh, forest garden will be established and this uh, October we we'll plant the trees but then still the whole situation of draft the right pronunciation draft dürre drought drought um, makes it also quite uh, difficult to realize this maybe no? so the, all the trees we planted in the last season now they really need now a lot of water in the first year they are there and it's it's a lot of work so we also need more people to be uh, uh, fascinated and work on this idea if, if we want an edible city then uh, the, the people from the city have to uh, join it hey but a question to you i mean do you think uh, where, where do you see the point where uh, for example the oasis systems from 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 Hoko can 
uh, interfere or help this situation here because I think I have a strange feeling that there is some kind of a good information that you can pass over. I'm not really sure what, but uh, I think it's interesting. No, it's a uh, it's the, the way of thinking and solving problems. Not that's why Laila was participating. She did this presentation about uh, the idea people have for the pantry uh, as an iconography, you know. And when people uh, listen the the word oasis, they think the desert, the film, the adventure. So it is not that we were worried about that. It is not what we do. We don't want to copy the image of an oasis with palm trees there. Just the problem they have, they have to face, and how we solve that, that, that That's all. No? There's something interesting, talking about the terminology, and also that should be maybe something revisited in urban planning and architecture, many other things. The word that people in Morocco use to mention uh, a plot in the oasis is garden, Hadeka. Uh, for me, Hadeka is a, it's a garden in the city, a beautiful garden, landscape, but not something just made for agriculture and for, for, for so that's also sometimes interesting how people use the, the, the words and the, the notion of something. You know. um, I don't know. We are. I'm going to. I, I told them to, to. I'm going to. We have been doing some sketches. Uh, okay, we have this problem. What are the possible solutions? Um, how can we place the the buildings? Which kind of buildings according to to the experience in Morocco also? Because that's another. That's also a problem in Morocco when talking about uh, rugged earth architecture. They think that something from the past. Uh, that if you live in a ramen earth building, it's because you are poor. And if you get some money, you are going to, to build a new house in concrete, in blocking concrete, which is too hot and too cold. And I remember one day I was with my student from the, uh, the architecture school of Tetuan, uh, drawing, making measures in the uh, in a place in the south. And someone. Uh, came to us and uh, what are you doing? Well, you know that uh, my wife wanted a new house so I had to do that in, in concrete. I told him, no, but you can do with this material ramen earth contemporary houses. Yeah, I know, but you have to explain that to my family. And you know, it's too hot here and in summer we come inside the facade in the old house that was two centuries because it's the only way to to survive here. So now, fortunately, uh, around Marrakech, there are people, Moroccan or foreigner, building new and contemporary houses, but with rammed earth. Because they know it's, and it's more expensive than doing that with concrete blocks. No? Why? Because there are less and less people that know how to build with that. I mean, it's, <coughs> it's a classic also. I mean, Germany, is the, the classic is the Fachwerkhaus, right? Because uh, normally the houses in former times were built from the material that was on site because you, had, you didn't have to transport it. So, for example, where I have my, my garden, this is kind of really, uh, valley, um, there's clay, there's hay, and there's wood. So that's what you build the house from. And that works perfectly well because, in a way, the uh, there is a certain kind of reason why this material is already there. Not because it makes a good housing, but because um, the, uh, the people in the, that were there and started the first buildings, they had to combine cultural, practical, ecological, uh, all these kind of things together to make a living in the place like that, right? I don't think they were thinking that way. They, they were not thinking, it was just normal. It was just normal, you know? because you had nothing else so now uh, we add something that's what is interesting what you said uh, we add a global perspective right in a global perspective concrete is modern um, it is promoted by uh, northern industrial countries blah 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 so uh, it wins some kind of a thing that doesn't function you know right it's, it's a, um, 
but but also that was also a cultural kind of moment, right? To say uh, we can um, we can do something that is completely against uh, what we have here, because as I think what is really interesting today in Germany is that the moment of uh, that you adapt to the landscape is very negatively uh, connotated, right? But that's what the people all did, right? So they normally they adapted to the landscape and uh, in. Uh, uh, luxury and modernism is that you don't uh, adapt to the landscape that you uh, that you uh, but more that you do something that you control it right and I think that's something we have to relearn uh, it's a relearning process to say that's the wrong way in a way um, and uh, that's why then it gets interesting to ask what kind of uh, possibilities does the landscape offer and I think that's very much connected with this Oasis system. I think maybe one, one interesting question really would be in the beginning when we not only take a single plot, which is kind of self-sufficient, but like a city, and then really the question, what, what do we really need to be self-sufficient? And it would be really interesting if you would say, okay, the city looks at itself at a whole, as a whole again. And because we had that in former times, of course, that the city has had enough land to, to at least feed its own people. Mm -hmm. But we, that's, that's gone away for a long time now. But, um, but, I, but I also thought that sometimes maybe if to, have to adapt it to today's or to our time today, it would also to be to kind of really know the resources also in existing buildings, the stuff we have already built. And um, I think there's also something, yeah, which we really could then connect to architecture and urban design to first reuse what we already have produced or which is already here and then with the time it would be really interesting if you would say okay Kassel is really again um, planting so many trees that and for the times when we have to build or reconstruct a roof or whatever we can use the local wood and we don't have to import it anymore because right so that would be um, it would be very interesting and then to scale it up how many um, how big would the forest actually get no? <laughs> to, to you can use 5,000 so. oaks. <laughs> yeah, 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 so yeah, there's a ah. decision of the city <laughs> council that Kassel shall plant 10,000 trees now. It's all one result of the climate, uh, Klima Rat. <clears throat> and then uh, a city also uh, provides another potential uh, which you can gain from something like urban mining. And we have also a good. Uh, movement here in Kassel about uh, a resource pool, about Materialverteilung and actually it's just a little step it could be for the city just to support this and to give us a storage. No? There's good proposal for that at Sanders House or the, or this, where we are also this year made an oasis again, no? just a pop-up oasis for 100 days for Documenta and uh, with the future village Zukunftsdorf 22, it's also and it, it's also important to see social structures within an oasis. Now how it works and if it can work on a commoning kind of way. Ne? And in this future village for the summer here, we we work very kind of strictly with the commoning principles and with the. Um, knowledge which there is in the patterns, uh, the proposed patterns of commoning from Silke Helferich and... Uh, That's another question with the was is uh, the social component. No. Uh, how people uh, treat water, how they share water. And we unfortunately had this uh, experience with uh, the Oasis we, where we work with artists in Tirmat in Gelmim. What happens when it, there is a fire? And when there is a community, yes, it's a tribe, but how everybody's helping everybody. And uh, that's something that uh, you don't have that anymore in, in a city, even in your own building you are living. And that shows that, again, when there is a catastrophe, you show the utility of what you have been working with for years. Um, there is also a way of doing policies competitive. Uh, you know. That's come from the from the oasis, but also a question of tribe. You know, the tribe more overall those who used to, to move uh, a lot. You know. And that's something that uh, is still alive in Morocco. You know. So I, I imagine that uh, 
when doing your project in there, maybe the people has a, a feeling of belonging to, to something that they are not going to find here in the city center. I don't know. Uh, I think we have also realized um, when we talk about uh, social structures and also resources that um, in the oasis the, uh, all the resource, also the space as a resource is used very efficiently. So yesterday we were looking at the plot sizes and how many houses are in one plot and we compared it to uh, family housing in, in castle uh, to uh, look at how many houses are there in one plot and the difference was almost in the same space you could house uh, almost double of the people with also the same height so you had like um, the houses were all, all connected uh, at, at, at least two sides not detached houses but they were uh, so built that uh, the family could use the first floor and when they needed to, they could expand to the second floor and I also think when we uh, talk about resources, we have to talk about how we use our space efficiently. So, what uh, are the needs of the city? So, right now we are talking about more heat and uh, also places where we can maybe um, conserve energy. So, in winter time, is it possible that everybody can heat their houses, or do we need places where everybody can gather during the daytime where they can get warm, for example? So, you know. So you have to think about which places are not used in the city or used not efficiently. So that's why yesterday we talked about a lot about how we can use the space efficiently as a resource. Not just the nature, natural resources, but also space as a resource. Very really important thing I learned about the oasis. Well, at least there is one person who made the, the workshop who understands <laughs> the purple. The others, but if not, what I have learned also in the desert and just in Dumasi is more extreme than in Dumasi is the life of nomad people. That uh, they... So imagine, if we say how to build a village with the oasis, or imagine that you are in the middle of the desert and you don't have an oasis to get the material. What you do? You use the hair of the camel and you build the, the tent with that. The camel, uh, the goats or the it does. All the clothes that you don't use anymore in winter in summertime, use that. And you can't waste anything, right? You waste I mean, nothing. You have, you have to use almost it. almost nothing. No? I mean that's also I mean I think I think uh, being completely dilettantic in an uh, oasis, uh, I can imagine that it's interesting to see uh, for example this point, right? That's that's a point here now that we waste so many things that we don't really need um, and just working with what is there and, and, and uh, I think it's, it's interesting because in an oasis some kind it's out of a need out of a um, um, yeah it, it can't be done in a way different maybe and of course uh, in, in the western countries I mean the problem is more uh, the, the overhead, you know, all these things that we don't need. You know, if you look around here, I mean, for sure there's 90% you don't need, right? And um, but the social aspect, I think, in it is much more important because uh, to get away from this moment, uh, to have more than you need, to uh, only take what you need, is a very so it's a social kind of moment, right? It's a discussion about what our society can afford. Um, to waste, to produce, uh, to pollute, all these kind of things. And I think the most important aspect in an oasis could be that the people, I think, are very aware, or could imagine that they're very aware of that they have to find a way how they can live together without destroying their small kind of uh, uh, ecology, right? Which is social, ecological, uh, economical, right? So um, I think. What we lost in, in, in Europe a lot is this kind of thinking of uh, ecology and what it means. Like which are the interdependencies, which are the interconnections between the things. And uh, we only think about the production of things, right? Of places, of things, of goods and things like that. And Oasis sounds much more like a community system, right? Uh, which we are in a way not anymore. So I think that's, that's something that is interesting to hear about. I have a question. Uh, 
Are there not some cities in Germany or in Europe which have uh, serious uh, Suffizienz strategy, sufficiency strategy, because this, uh, this term is not very sexy, sufficiency, but I think some urban planners should have this already in, in, in their uh, mind. But I don't think that any city has it applied to a kind of amount or total that it starts to work, you know? So I think there are these concepts. Um, and actually, quite often, like now, today, it's again like you could, if you use uh, now the hashtag resilience, um, Which one? resilience Resilient. in the moment, then you can actually put sufficiency and everything else underneath, you know. But this is now the moment where the minist minist ministries and the politicians will listen to you. So this is always also how you label something to actually actually do the same strategies. But then still, because it could mean on the one hand either a radical, radical different way to do things or a short term where you um, actually really have to reduce stuff. And always when you come to that point, I think, in urban strategy, the political support stops because they are afraid that people don't want to go with it. And this is so there are these strategies, there are these concepts, but they usually are never applied in a hundred percent way. And when you don't do them, I think at least 80, 90 percent, it doesn't function, right? It's not enough to, to work. So, and I don't think there's a, I don't know, maybe you know, I don't know any hundred percent sufficient city right now, which is really going for that goal. Everybody's going for the sustainability and more climate adaption. No, but but I mean, at the moment it's really just a label to put yeah. on things, but not, it's, when it, as you said, it's not 100% applied, it doesn't work. It's just yeah. an idea that it's, it's applied, but it's, if, it, if you don't do it 100%, it doesn't work. And the solutions are very often, I think, but maybe it's been different, is um, today, our solutions are very often technical, you know, mm. like the, the more complicated it gets, um, the solution is always even more technical. Yeah. We do need more resources to apply the solution. Yeah. Of course, there's still this uh, wish to keep it up on this level. No? And, um, yeah, and keep it, in the, and keep it um, in the line of production. That's important because this high-tech thing always makes more production. Right? So, so the idea is always like how can we increase production? Uh, and not decrease it, right? Yeah. So, so I mean, the moment where you where you want to change thing, and you you always have this FTP politics, right? Saying, hey, we have a technical solution. It always means a production. Yeah. Look yes. at the um, electro mobility. Mobility. I mean, it would have been logical to say we have to stop individual transport, individual traffic. Uh, uh, electro mobility, like it is now, is only a replacement of the other thing which for sure costs more pollution due to that all the things are produced new. But it's great for the, uh, for the industry, right? So they were the first ones to join that kind of course. So, I mean, I, I think that's really, the, that's really the, the turning point. As long as we stay in this kind of moment, like what you say, that it's just a labeling, that's just a, some kind of a, um, a label for a certain discussion, it's just a replacement discourse and not a change. Yeah. And to be honest, with this kind of time limits that we have, uh, it's quite drastic. Always comes also for me back to the term degrowth, no? but nobody picks it up. Wants that. Huh? No, nobody wants it because. On a, magazine, um, on a scientific magazine, as a title, degrowth. Degrowth? Yes. No. So that. But the, it's, yeah, but I don't know if it's going to be picked up. That's true. So. I mean, the problem is that, that I think uh, that people don't understand that um, they don't need all that they have. But not because they don't understand it, it's just because they're always taught that uh, you have to have more. It's very simple. For me, I, uh, I mean, we don't lose anything, to be honest, when we uh, have less, because we have too much. I wanted to ask uh, Carlos. Uh, what is your experience with the uh, oasis? Uh, how much can you grow there? How, is there a limit to how many people can be housed? Or uh, is there a, a natural border where the people are fearing that they are destroying the uh, environment? Because we talked about uh, desertification, right? Um, how the problem happens when the people don't use the land anymore, actually. 
So there's actually a, a, a really good balance in the Oasis. Or what do you think? Um, is there the, the resources are overworked, or is there a limit to how much can be done in the Oasis? It depends. We we've seen that uh, this 200 kilometers span growth by the six Oasis in the Dra Valley in Zagora. Now they are living 300,000 people. In we can say 60% in the all uh, Qasar, which means the all uh, fortified cities made on rammed earth. But then the, it's going growing faster and faster. The new settlements and the extension of all cities of new cities. You know? So there is it's a question of the certification. It depends, of course, on water, but then also that depends on if the people if, on tourism. If they are tourists. People prefer to work as a guide or to have a guest how so they don't work the plot anymore. Once you don't work in your plot, you don't entertain, maintain the plot, which means sun starts to come in. So they say, no, there is no water. No, just because if you say that you are uh, working your land, it's because you are poor. You have a guest how you have a business, so you are now you are the best of the of the place. No. However, now there are people investing and planting a kind of palm trees in some areas. Um, the problem also that uh, the part of the, the oasis has been disappeared because people also there is a question of the uh, migration, not just to Europe but overall to cities like Marrakech or Casablanca. Um, now they are using this uh, 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 empty space to build the city as if it was another city in the north of Morocco. No? But people are starting to complain because there is no trees, there is no green area, it's uh, uh, impossible to, to live inside. So two years ago, someone from the Moroccan government told me that they are revisiting all the urban planning in the Oasis area, where they have a special department. I don't know, some years ago they didn't know really how it works uh, uh, in Oasis. No? So um, it's complicated. It's complicated also. Also, they have problem because the population are not uh, are growing faster than than they expected. So they need to build more things. And there is the, there are oases where it is forbidden to build inside oases. Yeah, small oases don't you can still do that, you know, because there is no urban planning who knows about agriculture, who's going to say, okay, what we can do. So it is, we can or we cannot, but no, there is a balance. It, a balance that is already existing with the old uh, villages. So, but you have the problem that urban planning in the US need much more knowledge about sociology, about uh, water resources, about uh, architecture, about agriculture. Um, I can tell you, you don't learn that in Morocco because I've been teaching there. We try to explain that to the to the to the students. You know. However, there are associations in, in, in different regions in Morocco that they are doing this job. They are trying to keep people working the land because it's economically, from an economic point of view. It's worth it, really. You can earn a lot of money. Something like, imagine that you can earn, I don't know, 40,000 euros or 50,000 euros per year just w working on your land. So, it is not that it is a poor region and there is no other way. No, there is. So, and now they are trying to, to do better. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen. No? But in any way, it's again, it's what we can learn. No? Uh, I think we can learn a lot. If not from the Oasis, learn from the nomads, which learn from both also. We are learning from, from, from each other. Good finish. Final sentence, actually, to learn from the nomads. So that's the next workshop, learning from the nomads. Uh, no, just uh, let's see what's going to happen in the future. If we continue to work on to do things or to I mean, it's an interesting model somehow. I mean, it's um, I didn't get involved so much in it, but uh, and then at first it looks a little bit 
far away, right? Uh, because it's so isolated. This isolation kind of moment that you can imagine uh, of an oasis is really interesting, but it's like a micro model, right? To study some kind of, uh, for example, the social aspects of uh, how to organize new kind of ways of uh, complex living together also. Um, but I think it's still a question: How is it transferable to the city, right? Or uh, what does it what does it um, what does it say about the city? Or what does it what can it um, preserve for the city? But as a system, as a network system. Uh, mm. Association of Oasis. Association provoked by the geography, which is another thing. How the geography uh, conditions the system of Oasis and the form of the Oasis. And how they are in Zamora is very clear, it's just the valley. Another place is the, the river basin, which is the one who is holding the Oasis. And they are disseminated in a where people with the caravan used to be specialized also because the kind of tribe and you know, what kind of trade or class and it was like a, a kind of hub also it didn't happen but that was in the past with the, with the when you go to the artist is a kind of, uh, kind of uh, I mean, I, in a way, it's a little bit like like villages today, you know. And we have this discussion about uh, Dritte Orte and, and villages because they are, in a way, like also like in, in in the social way more like like isolated communities, even if they are not like in the Oasis example. Uh, uh, gathering around a certain kind of a, a ecological um, speciality, right? Um, but socially, it has a little bit like that. And uh, in Germany, you know, there's a lot of reflection now on, on villages as micro models um, in the search of kind of uh, questions how, or, or, or solutions how we can deal with our problems. Even if I think in the villages it got stuck a little bit, right? Because uh, in the end, um, that would also is also the question. Huh? It goes back to ancient systems. You know, we have a little village in uh, in the city now this summer. It's quite good experience. And did you also think about where in Kassel now we do the oasis, the next oasis? Did you look at the plan or you, you focused also on this area which Marcus described or uh, our area? I think they found another one, no? Yeah, we went, yeah, we went uh, I know, uh, also from the, from the um, Karlsau. Uh, we went a bit more to the south uh, where, the, where the river enters the city. So uh, uh, where the old mill is, you know the uh, power plant. We thought about um, if we are um, in uh, 10 years or 15 years, we should end our uh, CO2 uh, fueling energy, right? We have to use renewables. Uh, what to do about this place of the power plant? We thought about um, maybe this area where it's all, there's already agriculture, but it's monocultures. Um, and also the uh, environment provides uh, wind and their sun, uh, how can we um, change the place into an oasis and we looked at this place, so we looked at the old power plant and how can we um, do the oasis there, so we thought about the power plant using it as a, uh, as a base uh, where we can start the oasis and it, it can expand uh, onto the hill, so we could use, uh, use the land more efficiently than it is now used for uh, four to five villages. We agreed on five villages, I think, right? Uh, we looked at how the space can be used efficiently and then uh, we saw that around, if we uh, go with housing, we could 
do around uh, 500 houses or something there, and we will use uh, all the all the uh, environmental uh, resources for um, heat during winter time and to cooling uh, during summer time. So. Um, it was really an interesting geographical area because of the slope of the hill. Uh, he had a lot of great ideas. <laughs> For the next, let's continue to talk and to share. And we could also think about a kind of seminar where we can invite to participate on Zoom and friends of mine from the University in Rashidia working on the Oasis issues and just we need people interested to participate. We'll find you. We already tried. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you really for this nice work. Thank you for the yield. Yes. Come on, I'm here. Yeah. Say bye bye.